And welcome back, Roster Watch Nation. It's your friendly neighborhood trash man, and this is the Garbage Grab. On behalf of RosterWatch.com, where we have all the fantasy information you will ever need to dominate your leagues from draft throughout the championship. Today, I have for your viewing or listening pleasure the fantasy fallout for week two going into week three. It's only week two, well, the end of week two, rather, and fantasy owners are losing their minds due to injuries and or underwhelming play on behalf of the players that they drafted. And all I can say is relax. We're going to get through this, and the fantasy fallout going into week three is a big reason why. And here it goes. Starting it off, the Thursday night game, Buccaneers at Panthers. Buccaneers won this one 20, 20, 20 to 14. I want someone to look at me the way Bruce Arians looks at Peyton Barber. Despite being at best, <laughs> the second best back in Tampa, Barber got all the run in this one and it paid off. 24 touches, 89 yards, and a touchdown. Pick him up if you want. Just don't expect him to be anything more than a flex against the Giants this week. Ronald Jones, who I think is a better back. I think most be people, aside from Bruce Arians, thinks he's a better back. Can be left on waivers for now. O.J. Howard is in fantasy purgatory. He's got too much potential to drop, but he's not startable right now either. Bench him till he gets back on track, which we know he will. Just not sure when. On the other side of the ball, Cam Newton's head towels must be getting washed with a kryptonite-based detergent because Superman needs to run to get going, and he's not running at all. Bench him if you have other reasonable options at quarterback, and if not, just hold on and hope that he can turn it on against an Arizona team that is giving it up to quarterbacks right now. Greg Olson, six receptions, 110 yards, is a tight end one. And I'll fight anyone to the death who thinks otherwise. Only owned in 61% of leagues, he's going to produce as long as he's healthy. And we don't know how long that's going to be as he has not played a full season in, I think, at least three years. But roll with him if you got him. If Thursday night did tell us something good about the Panthers' offense, it's that Curtis Samuel and DJ Moore are both viable options on any given week. Samuel had five receptions, 91 yards, and Moore had nine receptions, 89 yards. So you can have them both in your lineups. And on the most part, it's going to work out. On to the next game, Cardinals at Ravens. Cardinals lost this one 17-23. to Kyler Murray wasn't able to pull this one out, but he is just the second quarterback to throw for over 300 yards his first two games. The first is Cam Newton, actually. This wasn't an easy feat against the Ravens defense that just made the Dolphins look like a Pop Warner team. Though, I don't think that will prove to be an exception this season for teams that are playing against the Dolphins. Anyways, Murray still isn't anything more than a streamer in fantasy as the Cardinals will face Carolina this week, but at least we can see the light at the end of the tunnel. For the second week in a row, Demir Bird, seven targets, six receptions, and 45 yards, worked as the number three wide receiver for Arizona being out-targeted only by Christian Kirk, who had eight, and Larry Fitzgerald, who had 11 targets. It might be time to give him a look in PPR formats. I never thought I would say that two weeks ago. I can't believe I'm saying it now. David Johnson left the game in the second quarter with a left wrist injury, but was able to, ret to return. He'll be fine for week three, so don't worry about it. On the other side of the ball, through two weeks, Lamar Jackson is your number one quarterback in fantasy, and he gets the Chiefs this week in an embarrassment of riches. I don't have to tell you to keep him locked and loaded. Marquise Brown, the rookie, Hollywood Brown, eight receptions, 86 yards, got a whopping 13 targets in week two, showing that his week one boom was not a fluke. He's a wide receiver, too, with upside and what is now a surging offense. And on to the next game, 49ers at Bengals. 49ers won this one 41-17 to in Cincinnati. Are the 49ers a good team? 
We may never know. I do know that Raheem Mostert, 151 yards and one touchdown, is a dual threat, and he's owned in only 15% of leagues. And Matt Breida, who had 132 yards, is still available in 15% of leagues. So go get him. Debo Samuel is the number one wide receiver in San Francisco. Dante Pettis, Dante Pettis, as far as I'm concerned, is droppable, as Marquise Goodwin is also playing ahead of him, and Trent Taylor is soon to return. Don't get too worried about Joe Mixon on the other side of the ball. 14 touches, 27 yards. Only 27 yards. The Bengals were playing from behind for most of the game and thus abandoned the run. It's worth putting offers out to worry some owners for Mixon, as they'll probably be a little bit keen on moving him. John Ross continues to roll as the big play receiver for the Bengals. He hit pay dirt on a 66-yard touchdown in garbage time, but we'll take it. Now is a perfect time to sell high on Ross, as A.J. Green is a couple weeks away from returning, and we don't know that Ross will be as fortunate this week. Tyler Eifert, tight end extraordinaire, is going to be touchdown dependent, but he's a streamable tight end in fantasy for now, as long as he's healthy. And that may not be for too much longer. On to the next game, the Chargers at the Lions. Chargers lost this one, 10-13. to After being told Mike Williams would only be used in the red zone due to a knee injury, Williams went on to five targets, three receptions for 89 yards on Sunday. His knee held up, it seems, so Williams would see even more usage this week against the Texans in what should be or at least could be, a shootout. Tight end Virgil Green, two targets, one reception, nine yards, was an afterthought in the Chargers' offense. It does not look like he'll be an effective replacement for Hunter Henry as far as fantasy is concerned. Well, on the other side of the ball, we've now seen TJ Hawkinson's floor. (laughs) Three targets, one reception, seven yards. He's still worth starting, but we need to pump the brakes a little on crowning him as the second coming of Rob Gronkowski. Danny Amendola, who had 13 targets, 104 yards, and one touchdown in Week 1, was even worse than Hawkinson in Week 2. One target and zero receptions. You can't take a chance on that kind of swing in fantasy. Amendola is droppable in all but the deepest of leagues, in my opinion. On to the next game, the Vikings at the Packers. Vikings lost this one, 16-21. True to form, Kirk Cousins, 230 yards, one touchdown, two interception, is having another slow start to the NFL season, as usual. He usually doesn't get going until about six games into the season, as a general rule. But he might have a decent line against the Raiders this week. Jamal Williams... Had 32 snaps to Aaron Jones' 42. He came away with 41 yards and a touchdown, though, making him a borderline flex in deep leagues, though this is probably the upper limit of his value in fantasy. Geronimo Allison, one of my preseason favorites when he was coming into the league, managed to come away with a touchdown in this one on the way to a four-reception, 25-yard line. It's not much but at least we know he's not forgotten in the offense. I still wouldn't bother him, or bother with him, rather, in week three against the Broncos. Jimmy Graham goose-egged in week two after a decent week one showing. He's the definition of touchdown dependent. Put him in your lineups, if you will. Just know that if he doesn't score a touchdown, there's a good chance he's not going to get anything for you. On to the next game, the Jaguars at the Texans. Jaguars lost this one 12-13 in Houston. Gardner Minshew wasn't nearly as bad as he could have been in his first start as an NFL quarterback, but he wasn't good either. He padded his stats with 56 yards on the ground. He's not usable against the Titans this week. It's good to know though, that Chris Conley and DJ Chark maintained a rapport with Minshew this week. 
Conley had four receptions, 73 yards. Chark had seven receptions, five, 55 yards, and a touchdown. Minshew practiced with them all camp. The same cannot be said for D.D. Westbrook. He's a slot man, and he was a first-teamer all camp. Until Foles comes back, you're going to see inconsistency out of Westbrook, I'm afraid to say. It only took a week on the other side of the ball for Carlos Hyde, 20 touches, 90 yards, to leapfrog Duke Johnson as lead back for the Texans. Maybe his usage was somewhat game flow dependent, but Hyde needs to be owned in more than the 43% of leagues he's owned in right now. I'd hold on to Johnson, though, as he could come in handy against the Chargers if the struggling Texans fall behind early, which there's a good chance that they will. Kiki QT, maybe my favorite name in all of football, two receptions, seven yards, didn't have much to show for it, but he was third in targets behind Hopkins and Fuller. Hopkins had eight, Fuller had seven, QT had four. On to the next game, the Patriots at the Dolphins. The Dolphins got blowed out 43 to nothing. They're tanking, folks. It might have been because he thought he might only get a week out of him as Antonio Brown's rape accuser meets with the NFL today, or maybe not today, sometime this week. But Tom Brady searched for A.B. all day in Sunday's route of the Dolphins to the chagrin of Julian Edelman's owners. Edelman had only four receptions and 51 yards. If Brown comes away unscathed, it could be bad news for Edelman's fantasy outlook as both Brown and Josh Garden are going to eat into his targets. And there were generally a lot of mouths to feed in New England on Sunday. It's going to be hard to predict who will come away with a meal after Brown and Sony Michelle. So I hope you're not depending on Edelman or James White or Josh Gar Gordon to carry your squad because I don't think they will. On the other side of the ball, the Dolphins are shopping Kenyon Drake, and a trade might be the only way Kalen Balaj is going to see the time of day. Balaj was useless on a day that the Dolphins had to drop the run like it was one of Dante Moncrief's passes. Preston Williams, four receptions, 63 yards, was the only consistent producer from week one to week two for the Dolphins. Make sure he's owned in Dynasty. Devontae Parker did have seven targets in Week 2, but he caught absolutely none of them. On to the next game, the Bills at the Giants. Bills this, won this one 28-14. Devin Singletary was the more dynamic back, 9.5 yards per carry to Frank Gore's 3.6, but Gore led the Bills in carries with 12 and yards with 68, in addition to one touchdown. Singletary is currently dealing with a hamstring issue. So pick up Gore, who is likely to be on your wires at just 8% ownership right now, which is kind of ludicrous. Josh Allen is making out to be a, ca a capable fantasy quarterback to start this season. 253 yards passing. 21 yards rushing, two touchdowns in this one. He's an upside play against the Bengals this week, but all bets are off when he gets the Pats the following week. Don't count on him, folks. On the other side of the ball, Benny Fowler looks like the number one wide receiver in New York right now. Ten targets, five receptions, and 51 yards with Sterling Shepard. And now Cody Latimer, who got a concussion, our sideline. Expect Fowler to lead Giants wide receivers in receiving against Tampa this week as a DFS and Deep League flex special. Eli Manning is toast, but you weren't using him in fantasy anyways, though. Were you? Were you? I hope you weren't. On to the next game. Seahawks at the Steelers. Seahawks won this one 28-26. And a nail biter. Russell Wilson reminded us why we can't forget about him in fantasy. With a 300 yard, three touchdown day, in addition to 21 yards rushing. I'd rather have Wilson than Cam Newton right now as my quarterback. 
I'd rather have several other quarterbacks than Cam Newton right now, to be honest. Even though I love him. Love him more than most. Rashad Penny, 10 carries, 61 yards, one touchdown. Saw increased action this week with Chris Carson losing two fumbles in addition to the one he lost last week. Carson is still probably the leader in the backfield, but Penny needs to be owned in more than the 60% of leagues he is now owned in. Tyler Lockett's scary week one was just an apparition, it seems. Wilson peppered him to move the ball downfield all day. 12 targets, 10 receptions, 79 yards. I'm less bullish on tight end Will Disley, who had five receptions, 50 yards, two touchdowns, who comes and goes in fantasy with regularity. There's a glut at the tight end <laughs> position this season, so I'm not relying on Disley outside of deeper leagues, at least not for now. Juju Smith-Schuster owners are biting their nails to the quick in anticipation of news on whether Big Ben will need season-ending elbow surgery. As of now, I think he actually does need season-ending elbow surgery, so that's not great news for Juju Smith-Schuster and worse news for basically every other receiver on the Steelers. Mason Rudolph did a decent job filling in on Sunday, but the outlooks of all Steelers' offensive skill players shrink from here on out, unless Rudolph does a miraculous job, which he very well could. You know, Big Ben did when he came into the season, into the, oh, into, into the NFL, rather. So we'll see what happens, but I'm not banking on it. Dante Moncrief can be dropped off of a cliff into an active volcano. That is all. When Rudolph becomes the play caller in Pittsburgh, his biggest beneficiary is going to be Vance McDonald, or it should be Vance McDonald, who had seven receptions, 38 yards, and two touchdowns in this one. As everyone knows, a young quarterback's best friend is his safety blanket tight end. On to the next game, Colts at Titans. Colts won this one 19-17. Jacoby Brissett threw for only 146 yards on Sunday, but three of those passes went for touchdowns. I'm not exactly excited about his prospects, but with so many quarterbacks going down to injury in Week 2, he's on the streaming radar against Atlanta at home this week. Jordan Wilkins had 82 yards on five carries, looking powerful in the process. He's a big guy. Brissett is going to need all the help on the ground he can get, so keep an eye on Wilkins. You might be able to use him. Chester Rogers tied Eric Ebron for second in targets with four on Sunday. It's going to be anyone's guess as to who will get air action behind T.Y. Hilton this season, though, so it's not really moving the needle for me. On the other side of the ball, Deion Lewis is droppable in all but the deepest of leagues. And this is what I expect out of the Titans' offense. Slow and unsteady. Derrick Henry will maintain borderline running back one value every week, but <laughs> virtually every other skill player, offensive skill player, will be subject to mediocre days like this. A.J. Brown, the rookie, is well on his way to becoming the Titans' number one receiver, which is kind of like becoming the Rams' number four receiver. Marcus Mariota didn't practice on Monday. If he can't go this week, <laughs> nothing much changes, actually. This offense runs through Derrick Henry. On to the next game, Cowboys at Redskins. The boys won this one 31-21 in D.C. Tony Pollard... Fell back to earth in this one. Five touches, 25 yards. He's basically just a high-end handcuff. I'm not flexing him. Michael Gallup continued his second-year surge, pacing the Cowboys in targets with eight in receptions with six. He's the real deal, and he's available in almost 20% of the leagues. Unfortunately, though, he'll miss the next two to four weeks with a meniscus tear. Wide receiver Devin Smith was only active because Taylor Austin was out with a concussion, but he made the most of his appearance with three receptions, 74 yards, and a touchdown. The former Ohio State speedster reminded us why 
He was a hot commodity coming out of college with his field stretching ability. He'll take Gallup's place while he's out, so go get him. Randall Cobb had a down game with only 25 yards, but he was second in targets with six, so hold on to him. Adrian Peterson, on the other side of the ball, ran as the number one in Washington and managed to salvage his day with a touchdown. But in all truth, Chris Thompson is Washington's most valuable back right now, at least until Darius Geis returns. And I said it last week, and nothing that happened on Sunday makes me think otherwise. Terry McLaurin, five receptions, 62 yards, and a touchdown, is the number one receiver in Washington and needs to be owned in more than 50% of leagues. On to the next game, Chiefs at Raiders. Chiefs won this one 21-10. Demarcus Robinson, six receptions, 172 yards, two touchdowns. Should be your first waiver wire priority this week. I said it. He's owned in only 7% of leagues, so you can go get him. Both LaShawn McCoy and Damian Williams left Sunday's games with injuries. McCoy with an ankle, Williams with a knee. Williams seems like the more serious issue of the two, though. If neither one of these guys can go, Darwin Thompson is your man. He needs to be added as a precautionary measure. On the other side of the ball, Hunter Renfro, four receptions, 30 yards, had another paltry line this week, but he did lead the Raiders in targets with eight. He's a deep bench hold who could get a bump if Tyrell Williams can't get through the hit pointer he suffered this week. Josh Jacobs. Came out of Sunday's tilt with the Chiefs with a groin injury. He should be good to go this week, but keep up with the story. Jalen Richard was second in snaps for Oakland running backs. On to the next game, the Bears at the Broncos. Bears won this one 16-14 in the Mile High City. If anything good came out of the Bears' offensive endeavors, it's that they've realized that David Montgomery is their best bet and moving the ball on the ground going forward. Montgomery had 19 touches for 68 yards and a touchdown. Hopefully the Mike Davis experiment is over, but you never know with Matt Nagy. Tariq Cohen disappointed, but he was still second in targets behind Allen Robinson, who had seven. Cohen had five. Cohen should have a better line against the Redskins this week, so keep rolling with him. On the other side of the ball, Royce Freeman was a better back this week outgaining Philip Lindsay 102 yards to 66 against the Stout Bears front. He even caught more passes than Lindsay. He caught five of those. Freeman is still unknown in 25% of leagues, and that should not be the case. On to the next game. The Saints lost this one to the Rams 9-27. to Drew Brees, an Austin native, tore a thumb ligament on Sunday, and he'll be out for at least the next six weeks. Teddy Bridgewater now takes over, and though he's a capable quarterback, I don't feel comfortable starting any Saints receivers who aren't named Michael Thomas. Latavius Murray, on the other hand, could get a bump. The Saints are likely to grind it out with the Seahawks this week, and unless the Hawks go out to an early league, which they very well could, in which case... The Saints would probably abandon the run. But otherwise, they'll need to run the ball as much as possible, and that would be mean more action for Murray. On the other side of the ball, Robert Woods had the worst game he's had since the 2017 season on Sunday with two receptions for 33 yards. Jared Goff was shaky for a lot of the game, so he relied on a safety blanket Cooper Cup for most of the day. Woods will bounce back. On to the next game. The last game I have for you, the Eagles at the Falcons. Eagles lost this one 20-24. Alshon Jeffrey and Deshaun Jackson both left the game with injuries on Sunday night. Jeffrey with a calf, Jackson with a groin. Nelson Aguilar, eight receptions, 170 yards, 107 yards, one touchdown, went off in their absences and would stand to be a wide receiver too this week if neither Jackson nor Jeffrey can go against the Lions. Zach Ertz, Mac Hollins, and J.J. Arcega whiteside would get boost as well. Miles Sanders started over Jordan Howard this week, but neither back to get anything going. I'm not comfortable starting either of these guys as more than a flex this week <laughs> and onward. 
On the other side of the ball, Ido Smith, four carries, 32 yards. Had more re- rushing yards than Devontae Freeman, who had 11 carries for 22 yards for the second week in a row. Freeman salvaged his day in the passing game with 42 yards, but this isn't great news for either back. Smith isn't going to beat Freeman outright for the job, but he'll stay involved enough to lessen Freeman's impact. Now is a perfect time to buy low on Freeman if you are hurting at running back. And that's it for the fallout this week. Stay tuned for later in the week when we'll have the garbage grab bag. Those players who you'll still be able to get on the waiver wires to fill in for your injured or erstwhile players. And this is the Trash Man on behalf of RosterWatch.com. Until next time, be ready.